Good evening, everyone. I'm Michael Cavanaugh, and I'm pleased to say that my first official duty as president of the New Amsterdam History Center is to welcome you to a signature NAHC event, a fresh look at an old idea that 18 languages were spoken in New Amsterdam. Open any textbook, go on any tour of New York City, and you'll hear this figure cited. Our two speakers are about to debunk this old idea, however, and explore just how astonishingly multilingual and multicultural New Amsterdam was from its very start. Let me first thank our speakers, Ross Perlin and Peter Christian Eigner, as well as the Gotham Center for New York City History for hosting us this evening. I also would like to thank this program's organizers, our trustees, S. May Berg, Firth Faben, Jan Ramirez, and Ina Lee Selden for all of their hard work in putting this event together. My fellow board member, Vani de Groot, senior lecturer in Dutch at Columbia University, will now introduce our speakers. Vani? Thank you, Mike. In 400 years, New York has exploded from a small settlement of 300 people to a metropolis of eight and a half million. The original population spoke a handful of languages. How big was that original handful? Well, more than the oft-cited 18. This afternoon, we are pleased to have a linguist and an historian here to explore how this handful of languages exploded to more than 700. It is my pleasure to introduce Ross Berlin, co-director of the Endangered Language Alliance, and Peter Christian Agner, director of the Gotham Center, as they discuss how New York City grew into the most linguistically and culturally diverse city in the world. Good evening. Uh, my name is Peter Krishnagar. I'm the director of the Gotham Center for New York City History at the City University of New York's Graduate Center. And uh, I want to extend my own thanks to uh, uh, the trustees of uh, the New Amsterdam History Center for, putting, for helping us put together this event, um, which gives us an opportunity to showcase forthcoming work um, by uh, last year's Robert D.L. Gardner Fellow at the Gotham Center, Ross Perlin who is the co-founder and co-director of the Endangered Languages Alliances, Alliance here in New York City, and is working on this wonderful project that as, the, um, as you just heard, um, is actually much larger than the organizing framework for tonight's discussion. So um, as you just heard, we have 700 languages uh, currently uh, being in use in some, uh, to some extent or another in New York City. This is part of what um, Ross's work at the Endangered Alliances uh, of the ELA um, entails is bringing back uh, some of these languages, many of which are endangered. Uh, but we find ourselves sitting in the most linguistically diverse city in New York. And as part of the um, much larger story that Ross tells in this forthcoming book that he um, was working on at the Gotham Center last year and should be out for publication soon. I'm not sure if we have a publication date yet, Ross, but. Um, uh, it is imminent. Um, uh, it is under review and uh, will be in your hand shortly, I hope. Um, uh, explores both the history of this, you know, unparalleled linguistically diverse city from the early days, the Dutch and Lenape up to the present um, and showcases a lot of the work that they're doing at the ELA. Uh, this is a fantastic project. I'm, I'm thrilled that we could be hosting Ross um, at the center last year um, and supporting this work. And I wanna thank also the funders for the fellowship program that underwrote this, the Robert D. L. Gardner Foundation um, for their support in uh, underwriting this kind of work. Um, so uh, Ross, I don't know if you wanna uh, say a little bit more about your project um, and the scope, or if you think I've done a fair job of it. Um, but as we, uh, as you you know, as the as you all know from the um, title of this talk, what we're going to be talking about tonight is actually just a, a smaller piece of this larger work, um, but a very interesting question um, and a very counterintuitive one, um, as our uh, as the trustees uh, just mentioned, um, this notion that the Dutch colony was actually far more diverse than your average person um, may assume. Um, uh, uh, the the length, the number eighteen, which is sometimes thrown out. Um, is has become a kind of a bit of a, a standard maybe for a, um, uh, have some sort of uh, passing familiarity with uh, the city of the, the history of the Dutch colony. Um, scholars know, of course, that 
Um, this was a incredibly diverse colony from the start, um, uh, as uh, you'd expect from a sort of imperial entrepot um, in what um, scholars often refer to as this uh, burgeoning Atlantic world. Um, so um, I think we should just jump in at the start and jump in where the Dutch would find themselves. And that is in this you know, continent that already housed hundreds, if not what, thousands of languages maybe, um, and talk about the first peoples of New York City. Um, the people who occupied New York before it became New Amsterdam. Um, and I'm talking, of course, about the Lenape. Um, Ross, you write in the, in, the, in the book that in terms of indigenous languages in New York, Lenape was certainly the mother, the original mother tongue of this land. Um, but of course, there were obviously many other indigenous languages that have always passed through up until today, when I, uh, I think you note in the book, this is maybe... Uh, there's, there have never been so many indigenous languages spoken in New York than at the present moment. Um, uh, we'll talk a little bit about that later. Um, uh, uh, so um, uh, today, you know, we find ourselves in this linguistic, um, in this incredibly uh, diverse linguistic city in terms of those indigenous languages. But um, I wonder if you could just sort of put us in place a little bit um, uh, in terms of the linguistic landscape that the Dutch themselves would have found themselves in. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Peter. And thanks, thanks to everyone for coming. Thank you to, uh, to the Gardner Foundation, to Gotham Center for, for hosting me as I, as I work on this linguistic history of New York City that Peter mentioned, which also then kind of brings things to the present day and focuses on um, six speakers of endangered languages from different parts of the world who have come to, to New York, uh, um, which is, as, as Peter was saying, I mean, the most linguistically diverse city in, in the world, probably, with over 700 languages that we've documented uh, at the Endangered Language Alliance over the last decade or so, um, and perhaps the most linguistically diverse city in the history of the world as well. Um, so there's a lot to say about that and the wider project and, uh, and how it came to be that way. Um, but, um, but I think a very important place to start is with, is with Lenape and with the, with the native languages of, of, this, of this land. Um, and, um, you know, and then I think, you know, we'll, we can spend just a lot of time today really just talking about kind of where this all started, um, you know, beginning with Lenape and then the sort of the extraordinary diversity, which I think has been still not fully understood, um, of the early Dutch years as well. So thank you to the New Amsterdam History Center as well for providing this, this opportunity, uh, to just by kind of exploring the, the, the sort of the number 18 kind of also opening a wider lens onto um, you know the question of just how how deep diversity goes now over you know linguistic diversity over four centuries into the fabric of this of this place. Um, so I might just share a couple of maps and a couple of images just to um, try to give us a little bit of a sense of uh, uh, of what we're of what we're talking about. Um, so let me see if uh, sorry if uh, if that's uh, if that's working here. Says you've started sharing, but I yeah. don't see yet. Attempting. Uh, it says my screen sharing is paused. Resume share. Okay, I'm I'm just it's just saying my screen sharing is paused. I don't know if there's an easy technical fixed to that, but... Um, Why don't you send that to me and I'll, I'll share it up and you get going. Yeah, I will, uh, I'll just kind of, I'll, I'll, I'll talk through the, through, the, through the basics and then we can um, kind of display the images afterwards. Um, so, you know, we're talking about, about Lenape as a kind of, um, uh, as a kind of cover term really for, uh, for a great deal of, of, of linguistic diversity, kind of, what linguists would characterize really as a dialect chain of, uh, of related of you know related languages from the same kind of linguistic family as I'll as I'll get to in a minute, uh, but um, you know really that there, there was likely you know kind of diversity even from sort of settlement to settlement from what we know about Lenape settlement patterns native settlement patterns you know people were in sort of relatively small settlements a large number of them kind of throughout the area and. Um, you know, there's there's no written evidence of of what was spoken here until the period of, of colonization, but um, 
um, you know, it's uh, it, it's it sort of stands to reason from what we from what we do know that uh, um, that there would have been considerable diversity from place to place, and 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 there even wouldn't have been a sort of single term like Lenape necessarily that would have characterized. I mean, that that seems to emerge as a later term, originally meaning something like human being. Um, but uh, you know, coming to mean this specific group of people. So kind of the wider picture is this language family, which linguists refer to as algic. Uh, and uh, this is one of the major language families of North America. Um, and uh, we can kind of, we'll see here, yeah, this, this, this map, thank you, Peter, uh, where uh, we see kind of highlighted some of the major, the major algic languages. Um, and uh, as you can see, this is a considerable portion of Northeastern North America. Um, you know, the, the sort of the best estimates that I'm aware of for the overall kind of linguistic diversity and linguistic picture of North America. Um, and again, some of this is, this, it's really about kind of trying to reconstruct, um, you know, as best we can, were that sort of north of the Rio Grande before the era of European colonization, that there, there may have been kind of at a minimum something like 300 languages spoken north of the Rio Grande across, you know, what's now the United States and Canada. Uh, and the diversity within that was considerable um, in terms of different language families, which is to say different whole kind of stocks or groups um, speaking languages as different from one another as English from Chinese. Uh, so completely different language families, many linguistic isolates, which is to say, you know, again, as far as we know, you know, languages which were not even necessarily connected to other families um, and uh, just considerable diversity in terms of the linguistic features as well of these languages, not just the vocabulary, but basic things in terms of the grammar. Uh, so, you know, this reflects just how far back settlement went, which of course is still a kind of debated point, um, but uh, it also reflects all the different kinds of life ways and cultural, you know, traditions and ways of being that, that, that native peoples of North America had. So just looking at Algic, again, this is one of the largest families in terms of the um, number of people speaking it as well as the, the land covered, you know, including some, you know, still kind of some of the largest languages of native North America, like, like Cree and Ojibwe. Uh, and, uh, and indeed, including a couple of languages, even in far Northern California. Uh, I mean, we could, we could talk uh, about this, this language family, you know, all, all, all day. And this is a major sort of specialty of many linguists. I'm not a specialist in this language family, but, uh, but this even includes a couple of languages of Northern California, Wiyot and Yurok. Uh, Yurok, which are, uh, you know, seem to be very far, right, from the other, from the others. Uh, and, uh, you know, today are in, in, you know, again, many of these languages have faced uh, just enormous pressures uh, and, and uh, you know, genocidal pressures, cultural pressures. Um, so it's, it's amazing that many of these languages still are spoken or being revived to different degrees. But I just want to maybe focus or draw your attention to kind of the eastern seaboard where we're, we're looking at the subgroup of the Algic languages, which are known as, which is known as Eastern Algonquian. Uh, and within that, you have, you know, a, a series of languages more closely related to each other from this language family, which uh, kind of climb the eastern seaboard, really from North Carolina to Nova Scotia. And then within that, you can see, you know, maybe you can make out the small print that says Delaware, which is the um, exonym. It's the sort of outside name that European colonists gave to uh, what today speakers and members of the groups themselves would, would refer to as Lenape. Uh, and so this covers an area, you know, bigger than New York City for sure, and kind of roughly uh, mapping onto and connected to the watershed of the Delaware River, uh, which, you know, is a major, a major American river uh, that uh, forms much of the border between, um, you know, New York and Pennsylvania, New Jersey and Pennsylvania, uh, and has many, many tributaries. So this would have been the world of, of, of the Lenape a world, as I said, a kind of a dialect continuum, probably where people kind of uh, from one settlement to another probably spoke very similarly. But, you know, perhaps if you took people from whole different ends of it, you know, say up in the almost in the Catskills in the north versus, you know, Cape May or something in the south, uh, there would have been quite some considerable differences. And then there are these, you know, all other related languages like Mohican, uh, like Narragansett, uh, 
um, you know, going up to Abenaki and even Mi'kmaq and so on, up the eastern seaboard with which there would have been, uh, you know, similarities, but also then significant differences. And we don't know how much mutual intelligibility there was or how much trade and travel, but certainly must have been some. Uh, and then, you know, not highlighted here are languages of other families, uh, of which the most prominent locally would have been the Iroquoian languages, such as Mohawk, um, which were, were, were dominant in, in upstate New York. Um, and, uh, you know, and those certainly, you know, and this is on, on the record once we get to the Dutch period, certainly would have been trade and people passing through and coming through speaking these very different native languages. Um, and maybe we can show the next slide quickly, Peter, as well, uh, to sort of zoom in on the Lenape area. You can ignore the, the term Lenny Lenape, which is kind of archaic now. Lenape is just preferred. Uh, but just again, kind of zooming in here a little bit, um, you know, this what I've called dialect continuum, which is probably reflected in some of these names, which are kind of the recorded uh, designations of, of, of some of these small bands or groups. Uh, within the Lenape world uh, that you can see, you know, whether it's, uh, you know, um, familiar names like Navasink, Raritan, Hackensack, Canarsi, Rockaway, these would have been, you know, groups that um, may have had quite distinctive dialects or ways of speaking, it's not, it's just not clear. But what we've been able to sort of, what's been reconstructed and understood certainly, you know, becomes very real and clear from the 17th century on and probably reflected some earlier situation was that there was broadly a sort of north-south split in this world uh, between what has come to be called Muncie in the north uh, as a kind of um, Lenape language or dialect, um, which is you know distinct from Unami in the south. Uh, and, uh, and then there's kind of an intermediate area, less is sort of known or agreed about sort of northern Unami as it's called. But broadly speaking, there are some clear linguistic differences, um, you know, L, for instance, the L sound in the north with the, with Muncie corresponding often to an R sound in the south, uh, and other sort of regular clear linguistic differences. But still, there probably was a good deal of understanding across these borders. Uh, and uh, you know, there's more we could get into about what happens after the sort of dispossession uh, and and indeed expulsions and and other pressures that Lenape people faced, being largely driven out of the area into you know, other, other parts of North America kind of one, one step at a time, uh, such that generally speaking, most Muncie speakers end up in Canada, in Ontario, by the late 18th century, early 19th century, whereas most Unami speakers end up by and large in Oklahoma uh, by the mid 19th century. And that's indeed where the languages have kind of continued to today, uh, highly endangered with, you know, attempts at revitalization, which we could talk about, but, uh, but basically, um, you know, driven out of the area over time, but, uh, but, you know, probably persisting for, for a while, certainly through the Dutch period. And so like other parts of the world where we find, you know, today we talk about say Italian, but, you know, this is a sort of a, a contemporary sort of blinders, you know, historically speaking, that would have been many more languages and you can replicate that example to other countries around the world. Um, uh, this is an incredibly diverse linguistic landscape, but we don't have the, the hard knowledge to know how much intelligibility there would have been within this linguistic family. So we could yeah. say say that that this might have uh, well have constituted even within this one linguistic group um, people who uh, had difficulties sort of um, speaking with each other um, even within sharing sharing these these common sort of building blocks of the of the family. Yeah, we don't know. So I mean, again, there have been. It's interesting. There were you know attempts and hopes to to sort of find some kind of writing or records pre pre colonization. Uh, and even the records from the Dutch period for Lenape are pretty are pretty sparse. We begin to get better records kind of um, and documentation by the mid 18th century, especially from Moravian missionaries uh, from Central Europe who were um, involved in missionary work and, and indeed, you know, uh, and, 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 and in sort of defending and working with Lenape people in, in especially in Pennsylvania, kind of in the mid 18th century. That's where we begin to get real, you know, some more solid documentation and, and things like this kind of difference between Muncie and Unami start to really become clearer or show up. 
Um, but, um, you know, so we have to kind of reconstruct what the, the communication situation would have would have been. Um, and, uh, you know, it's 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 hard to say, but uh, but, you know, some things are relatively clear. You can kind of see here that uh, Long Island, for instance, most of eastern Long Island, really beyond uh, much beyond kind of city limits, actually was a clearly a pretty different zone. Uh, it's not entirely clear what uh, what it would have been, uh, but it was clear that these were other eastern Algonquian languages which were probably more closely related to what was spoken across Long Island Sound in what's today Connecticut, uh, which is interesting, but makes sense too, I think in terms of the patterns of mobility and trade and so on, that actually Eastern Long Island was more connected to New England. That's, you know, actually remained true even sort of in the, the, the you know, colonial period with uh, English settlement kind of taking root in Eastern Long Island as opposed to, to the Dutch. Uh, so, um, you know, we've, you know, yeah, there's a lot that has to be kind of conjectured and reconstructed, but there does come to be sort of good evidence, uh, as I say, by the mid 18th century. There's also some interesting evidence uh, for a, a kind of Delaware pigeon, as it's been called, um, which was a kind of contact language uh, spoken both by, you know, by European settlers, including Swedish, Dutch, German, maybe English, especially in the sort of Unami area. So not in New York City so much, but probably in the lower Delaware, uh, in what's now New Jersey and Pennsylvania, uh, that actually through much of the 17th century, there would have been this kind of pidgin language, which settlers and native people were using to communicate actually. And uh, it's possible that similar things existed in New Amsterdam as well, and that we just don't have a record of them. And, and so in other words, this would be similar to, to um, the kind of linguistic, um, uh, well, I don't, I don't know what the term of art would be within linguistics, but um, this sort of create this sort of hybridization uh, that we find uh, among cultures along say uh, the West African coast when we find this, when we're looking at this point of this high point of contact at this time period. Yeah, from a linguistic, uh, the linguistic terminology, you know, is that pidgin is what's created when speakers of different linguistic backgrounds are coming into contact with each other and need to find a sort of way to communicate. And then the term Creole is usually used if that pidgin is then learned as a native language by the next generation, essentially. So it doesn't seem that there was any there's no evidence for any creolization happening, um, you know, and when that happens, it actually changes the features of the language. Certain things get kind of smoothed out and it really becomes, you know, uh, as happened, especially throughout the Caribbean, right? It really becomes then a, a, a new kind of language that is sort of regularized in certain ways and has certain grammatical features. That doesn't seem to have happened in any, the, the circumstances for that seem not to have been there in, um, in this case or in North America. Uh, but, uh, but definitely, you know, yes, there was, there was sort of scope and a certain kind of balance of, of power also maybe is reflected here as well as obviously certain trade patterns and, and modes of, uh, interaction, uh, you know, seem to have happened in this area. There's also kind of, you know, other similar places elsewhere in North America that perhaps it bears comparison with for which there's more evidence like uh, Chinook Wawa, which has been called Ch is Chinook jargon. It's also known as in the Pacific Northwest that formed sort of a uh, couple of centuries later through similar kinds of interactions in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, Mobilian trade language, which happened in the Gulf uh, in the Southeast. Um, and so, you know, these are, I think, often kind of forgotten moments in, in the history of, 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 of colonization in North America, these were actually moments of, of sort of a, a bit of a, um, uh, a sort of a, a more neutral ground that did develop where the balance of power was actually uh, more towards, uh, or you know, at least for a time, the balance of power was not necessarily in the hands of, of, of the colonizers, but actually kind of went more towards, uh, you know, that, that the colonizers had to learn at least However, imperfectly, to some extent, they had to learn a native language or a version of a native language. Of course, and some, you know, did indeed become fluent. And there are records from New Amsterdam, uh, which are which are very intriguing, of some of the Dutch settlers, especially those who grew up, you know, that very first generation, or some who really had to in the earliest years actually learning Lenape. 
Uh, and then there was a flow of, uh, you know, of, of, of some, you know, uh, certainly Lenape place names come partly then through this, uh, but then also Dutch words flow into Lenape, very interestingly. Well, I mean, we for, we forget this sometimes, but um, the colony of New York was uh, was a company that the, the states sort of are almost in many of these cases uh, sort of come in much later. This is a sort of a, a commercial venture and the purpose is trade. And so they are coming in to a certain extent, although these are militarized companies, the Dutch West India Company um, is a sort of infamous example, but um, uh, they are coming in there with the purpose of trading and furs and things like that. And so these actors then are purpose of the, this pigeon is created because there's a commercial purpose behind this, right? Or maybe some sort of diplomatic venture, right? Which maybe sort of extends at the margins to cultural sort of cross-pollinization of some kind. So yeah. well, let's, you, you brought up place names, so let's jump to that. Um, uh, I don't think we could uh, get away without uh, addressing um, some of those questions. Um, there's the famous ones, of course, Manhattan. Um, uh, but you write also about, you mentioned also a, a few others that people might be less familiar with, Gowanus, Rockaway, Maspeth, Jamaica, Canarsie, um, an untold number of place names that have vanished. So why, why have some of those names been preserved and, and why did others um, fall away? Place names are often an important and interesting area to look at uh, in terms of the persistence of, 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 of languages. Um, you know, where even after some kind of large scale colonization or invasion or language loss, place names sometimes remain well beyond the languages themselves. Um, and, you know, that's something you see around the world. It's it's also true, you know, in the New York area, where even after the the you know expulsion of, of Lenape people, several hundred place names, you know, seem to have remained. Um, now it gets, you know, it gets very tricky, you know, how they remain, right? In what form and what does that look like? And, and why do they remain? And do they refer to the same, you know, the same thing that uh, they once referred to uh, as their meaning is sort of lost, as they're adapted by, um, you know, speakers of other languages who don't understand them at all. And of course, we could also talk about or add on, you know, the whole issue of Dutch place names then remaining too, yeah. which is very interesting and, and also kind of has some similar dynamics. Uh, but, um, you know, the person who has kind of studied this the most uh, for the New York area, Robert Grummet, uh, you know, has also kind of very interestingly traced how many sort of um, essentially kind of false or corrupted place names there are, which seem to be native place names. Uh, so I think, you know, there's at least two things going on that I would identify. One is just, you know, the persistence of place names that were there first uh, and that sort of somehow sit on the land, kind of define the land. Um, and, uh, you know, I think often the original reference, you know, are quite different from the later reference. So, you know, Maspeth today may refer to a particular neighborhood with a sort of community board and with, you know, maybe even disputed boundaries exactly where it is, but this is sort of a neighborhood of Queens of the city. Whereas, you know, for instance, with Maspeth, one translation or idea is that it comes from some, some sort of term for bad water, possibly referring to part of the Newtown Creek or some other waterway, which was not good to actually use. Um, so that may have referred to the water, that may have referred to some area of land right around the water. It's sort of not known anymore, but, you know, things like um, land deals and the contracts around land deals would have kind of preserved these. Uh, and also just the fact that initial kind of colonists would have would have come across these names and this would have just been kind of presented as the name. Uh, and uh, and unless you had some kind of royal governor or official person or or some kind of, you know, Dutch West India Company magnate coming in and saying we have to call this you know, name it after New Amsterdam or do this or that. A lot of local people who were just doing sort of deals and settling would have just kind of taken up the name and continued to use it. Although, you know, they would have made it fit into their native language. So initially Dutch, perhaps later English, they would have kind of uh, inadvertently perhaps changed or misheard or, you know, corrupted the, the phonology, uh, the phonetics of it. Um, the other thing that happens that's interesting, which is kind of a story unto itself is, uh, is people sort of consciously doing sort of an act of placemaking, essentially, kind of wanting to have native names and, and perhaps even, you know, 
uh, inventing native names or sort of pulling them from elsewhere, thinking that this sounds Lenape or, or seems to be native. Uh, and that gets into a whole phenomenon of, of what, um, uh, you know, the, the, the scholar Vine Deloria, the native scholar Vine Deloria talks about, you know, playing Indian, the whole idea of forging an American identity. So this tends to come a little bit later, I think. Uh, forging an American identity through sort of Native American names and symbols and so on. So that then leads to uh, another group of names, which are, you know, often kind of more suspect and in, in terms of their actual etymology or whether they really are Lenape in what sense. But, uh, you know, none of these names are easy to kind of reconstruct. I mean, we could look at Manhattan, we could talk all about it. I would probably refer people to an article by Ives Goddard, who is a, a, a linguist who works on, uh, has worked a lot on Lenape and on the Algonquian languages in general, um, uh, you know, for, for his sort of uh, evidence that he's marshaled around the name Manhattan, which uh, traces back perhaps to a very particular spot on the, in the, with, with, you know, a certain stand of trees that, that bows were made from, uh, certain kind of hardwood trees at the southern tip of Manhattan. But, um, you know, you can just see how much discussion there's been about that one very famous place name, which uh, appeared first in the log books of Henry Hudson's voyage and then had a whole kind of career. So um, these things are very hard to reconstruct and trace, but but fascinating and vital traces of what was happening linguistically before, as well as in terms of subsistence and life ways. Yeah. Um, so it's not as clear cut, in other words, um, if you're following along, uh, whether this means the island of many hills, as is often sort of, as we often read in the press. Um, and um, to the point you were making earlier, uh, Tammany Hall, another sort of uh, famous uh, New York uh, phrase, uh, refers to um, the uh, Sackham Tamamend, who uh, there's some debate about whether he existed as well, right? That sort of fits into this model of the Vine Deloria sort of playing Indian. So, um, uh, okay, so uh, let's get to New Amsterdam then. Um, the, the Dutch finally uh, sort of kill and um, uh, uh, I'm sorry, uh, I skipped the question here. Um, uh, so uh, the Dutch uh, managed to um, push off the Lenape into the, in the greater metropolitan area of today's New York uh, during the mid six, six, uh, 1640s in Keefe's War. Uh, you write that as late as the early 1800s, though, we could find evidences of uh, Lenape being spoken at the edges of Manhattan, or even later in remote sections of Long Island and up in the Hudson Highlands or in the New Jersey Pinelands. Um, are these refugees? Are these people engaged in trade? Um, is this a speculative? How much? How much can we make of this evidence? Yeah, it's it's pretty uh, it's pretty fragmentary, but I think it's this is this is an important thing to note at least that um, you know there was a, a core area certainly of New Amsterdam that was being carved out where you know really Lenape people were not were not welcome uh, and the language you know really kind of had to go underground at, at, at best. Uh, but then, you know, the uh, the outskirts, the back lots of properties, right? The, uh, the, the hillier areas, the areas that you know, people didn't want to farm or settle, um, seem to have retained a, a real a real native presence for 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 quite some time. Uh, and um, you know, as I said, it's it's a really an extraordinary case of survival in general that uh, you know that Lenape is is brought through all of this, these series of expulsions and land deals to Oklahoma and Ontario, especially Ontario, where there is still a kind of continuous chain of native speakers, Oklahoma, where uh, that chain um, kind of continued until 2000, but now a whole you know new 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 group of, of second language speakers there on on the reservation are are trying to revive it. So uh, compared to all of you know all these languages on the eastern seaboard that we talked about. Um, excuse me, Lenape has had kind of an extraordinary survival. Uh, and uh, in some of these places, actually, it was it was actually, you know, maintained with some strength into the 19th century. And it was things like the residential schools, the, the sort of the boarding schools that uh, many Native people, children were, were forced to go to in Canada and the US that those actually played perhaps an even larger role in um, uh, in, in kind of pushing people to English, enforcing the language out of people. Uh, but in terms of, you know, in terms of the city, 
you know, it, it's it's clear. I mean, it's much debated, and the evidence is is is, is difficult to 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 to, to parse. But uh, you know, it's clear that there were both sort of uh, you know native people, and also maybe a, a large number of more mixed race people who had partly native roots, partly uh, African American roots, partly Dutch roots. Uh, were um, you know were able to sort of find refuge uh, in you know sort of areas that others didn't didn't want or remote areas where they were able to kind of survive and and continue. So you know yes, the main kind of body of 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 the group um, and, and there were you know obviously a, a, lot, a lot of different. A lot of different subgroups as well, but uh, had sort of had to keep moving further and further out. But those who were able to sort of subsist uh, seem to have done so. I mean, I, I wish there were more evidence about this, but uh, you know, it's um, it's clear that there, that there still would have been some individuals in what is today the greater metropolitan area uh, who, you know, it seems like they they would have. It, to what extent they spoke the language, what exactly they spoke, it's not totally clear, but uh, I think we can still see some of that going on kind of well into the 18th century. Okay, well, um, let's get to New Amsterdam then. So um, you write that New Amsterdam would only ever be partially Dutch, just as New York, uh, New York, the colony of New York, would only would never be completely English. Um, uh, as for the Dutch colony, um, only half of the folks who come early on were actually Dutch and maybe far less, you say, if we separate out even those first settlers, the Walloons and later groups like the Frisians and the Flemish, which include such famous Dutch icons as um, Peter Stuyvesant and Peter Minuet. Um, put somewhat differently, you say that um, what it means to be Dutch at this moment is far, from more, far more complicated than how we would understand it later. So can you tell us what you mean by that? Yeah, and this might be a good place to um, to show that other that next that next slide, which uh, you know. has sort of probably too much too much information on it, but I'll try to kind of uh, give an overview. So, uh, I mean, this goes back to to your point, Peter, about this being um, not a national colony, but an entrepot, a, a kind of uh, a company town, a, an outpost of of a, of a very cosmopolitan trading network. Uh, so, you know, the common denominator was not. Um, the Netherlands or Dutch ethnicity, it was uh, some kind of connection to, to the Dutch kind of mercantile world. Uh, so, you know, as part of my larger project of, of writing this linguistic history of, of, of New York, uh, I've tried to um, kind of reassemble and, and, and I think probably the first linguist to kind of actually look at what would have been going on really linguistically uh, in in New Amsterdam, uh, in what we know was already at that time probably one of the most extraordinarily multilingual places, and somehow set the template such that four centuries later, it just continues to 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 be and to and to grow in in extraordinary ways, almost to the point where you know it, it becomes a microcosm of the world. So this this kind of slide here is is my attempt um, through you know. And I'm not a I'm not a I'm more of a linguist than I am a historian of New Amsterdam. So you know it would be it would be be great to sort of hear. I, I, I'm ha really happy to speak to an audience here of many people who I think have immersed themselves with and have an understanding of of the history of those years. But kind of trying to sift through as much of the evidence as I can with a linguistic eye. Uh, this is this is some of how I've been able to sort of try to understand what would have been spoken here. Uh, so I've kind of grouped things a little bit here and, and this is where we get into the question of 18 if for those counting at home there's you know more than 18 on here uh but uh you know as i'll explain it's not really clear cut to sort of give a number here in general counting languages is uh, uh a difficult business for various reasons i mean one is that languages don't um they just don't lend themselves to being counted right these are things that are fluid things that are changing um and you know even just to sort of kind of say that a language is a thing is often really not 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 clearly the case as i've kind of discussed with lenape and that's so maybe starting kind of from the uh the native languages here you know i've put lenape varieties because as i said we're talking about a whole collection of um what may have been dialects what may have sort of counted as different languages and when i use those terms of course dialect and language these terms are very politically freighted at times i'm, I'm trying to use them in the linguistic sense of um 
you know, two things are different languages if they're not mutually intelligible, whereas they're two dialects of the same language if they are, broadly speaking, mutually intelligible. Uh, but of course, mutual intelligibility is itself not an easy thing and, and, and varies depending on who's involved in the, the encounter and what they're talking about. Uh, so I've put Lenape varieties because even within Lenape, you know, it's clear we're not just talking about one thing. And then I've, you know, I, I've put Susquehannock and Mohawk, which uh, are both from that very different Iroquoian language family that I mentioned, uh, because it's clear that, you know, uh, from from the evidence of uh, of the Dutch period that there were certainly, you know, people passing through at least and coming on a regular basis from those groups for trade. And that if anything, the scope for trade widened with the Dutch, you know, with the uh, with the beaver trade, uh, you know, there was uh, an increasingly kind of um, uh, wider area from which people were kind of coming and they, they you know, wanting to, to get wampum, which was often coming from Long Island or the coast, you know, that had value very far inland. Um, and uh, the exhaustion of, 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 of beaver hunting, pushing people to go further out. Uh, and then Mohican, you know, is, is quite close by really up the Hudson. So, you know, this is a sort of a minimalist picture of some of the native languages one would have encountered in, in New Amsterdam in the 1630s and 40s. Um, you know, then we have uh, the languages of enslaved Africans who were, who were being brought here. Uh, I, I kind of, you know, we don't have to, to, to say probably people hopefully have kind of grappled with a little bit the, um, you know, the fact that slavery was uh, was part of the Dutch colony from a very early period and bringing um, an increasingly kind of multilingual uh, group of African peoples to 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 these shores. Um, as with, you know, as with all of this, but maybe even more so the actual linguistic diversity of, of those who were brought here in slavery is hard to reconstruct. Uh, but it's clear that, you know, in different periods, there were there were places which, uh, you know, the slave, the slave raiders and traders were, 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 were drawing from and where networks were coming from. So, you know, um, Kimbundu and Kikongo were almost certainly uh, among the most common languages spoken by the first enslaved Africans who were brought here from what is today Angola. Um, and whereas, you know, those who spoke Malagasy from Madagascar and Akan and Popo later from other parts of West Africa, such as today's Ghana, uh, these were later places, uh, you know, kind of getting later into the 17th century that um, uh, enslaved Africans were being brought from. Uh, to what extent these languages were being spoken um, you know, in uh, in New Amsterdam or later in New York is not entirely clear, but there is, you know, some evidence that that people who were, you know, coming from Angola would have been marrying others from Angola, which points to that there may have been actual, you know, uh, uh, household formation and languages that were that were that were shared. Uh, of course, you know there were enormous pressures to not speak African languages, which would have been feared uh, from all the evidence we have uh, in general about the history of, of Atlantic slavery. You know, African languages were, were, were sort of literally, you know, kind of beaten out of people and there was enormous pressure not to speak them. And yet I think, you know, uh, there, is, there, is, there is reason to believe and to feel, you know, that these were very much present in some form in, in New Amsterdam and, and New York, if not many others. And besides that, um, you know, that this again is a very minimalist kind of list. Uh, and I, I, I would I would guess that this figure of 18 languages, which we're sort of speaking around, which was given by a, um, uh, you know, a priest who was quoting the uh, the governor, I think, yeah, Governor Kieft uh, of, of New Amsterdam at that time, uh, saying, oh, we have, you know, this, this, this famous quote, you know, 18 languages among the, you know, only three to 400 people here, but 18 languages. This is the, this is the quote. Uh, I feel it's likely that African languages and native languages were perhaps not even included at all in that, you know, and that that was really referring just to, to European languages. So that's part of, I think, what the discussion that, that, that I want to, you know, that we're having here tonight is about sort of the wider understanding and imagining of this as a, as a tri-continental city, a, 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 an outpost that was forming, 
at the intersection of America, Africa, and Europe, in a sense, and really accounting for languages from all three continents. Uh, so a lot more we could say there, but then I briefly want to just talk about the, the, the European languages here. Um, and I guess just to, just to add as well that, uh, um, you know, enslaved Africans in particular were likely to also be speaking other languages, to be highly multilingual. Um, and that's why I, I've sort of, I've put jargons, creoles, contact languages up there. We've mentioned Delaware, so-called Delaware pidgin, which would have been a sort of native European contact language. Uh, but, um, you know, there were almost certainly people also speaking uh, kind of these Atlantic creoles, likely based on Portuguese, uh, which at the time was kind of dominant in that space. Uh, these were forming, as I say, creoles, because they were actually now being passed on to the next generation. And these would later kind of, you know, somewhat argue, these became some of the creoles that, you um, you know, are, 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 are now very much part of the Caribbean and, and Northern South America. Uh, so those also likely would have been spoken and, and there would have been, it would have been very important to have lingua francas connecting uh, all of these different groups, not just with each other, Dutch being the sort of ultimate lingua franca during the, the Dutch period, uh, but one just, you know, among among those of African descent or, you know, those those of native descent. Um, and then, so in terms of the European languages listed here, um, you know, Peter has mentioned this, uh, the, what it seems, you know, that others have, have already kind of found historians of the period that more than, you know, at most, you know, half of the, um, half of the population was really quote unquote Dutch, but that in itself included considerable diversity because what we now think of as Dutch or the Netherlands was a, was a quite different story back then. Um, but, uh, but really it was a whole kind of a wider world of people who had been drawn into Amsterdam and into the Dutch kind of global mercantile world from different parts of the North Sea and then even different parts of Europe and even the Mediterranean. Uh, so, you know, it's clear that, uh, that there were a lot of, uh, of, of, of kind of Flemish and Frisian people among the Dutch and Walloons as well, speaking something closer to French. Uh, and then a considerable number of French speakers themselves, um, you know, especially after the, the Huguenot uh, arrival of, um, you know, the, by the later 17th century. So going into the English period, but even before that. Uh, Spanish and Portuguese were just prevalent as kind of transatlantic languages. Uh, and then there were, you know, at least a small number of individuals um, who would have been using within their own families or perhaps just themselves uh, who were, would have been using different, you know, Germanic varieties. Again, this is before there was a Germany, different Scandinavian languages. Again, the, the map of Europe was just totally different before nation states. Uh, and then even, you know, some extraordinary individuals who were, uh, you know, speakers of, of, of Polish or Arabic or Venetian, um, you know, whether they had a chance to speak those languages is perhaps doubtful in New Amsterdam, but they brought those languages with them. Um, so, I mean, what it means to have a, a, a lingua franca um, depends in part on one's occupation and their, and their sort of experience within this a wider world of, of trade, both within the Americas and, the, in the, and, and on the other side of the ocean. Um, do we have a sense for whether that was the same for the native peoples? You know, it's not, yeah, it's, 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 it's not clear. Um, I think that, uh, you know, I think Dutch, there were, Again, Dutch did serve perhaps increasingly over the over the years in New Amsterdam. Dutch was Dutch was the Dutch was the lingua franca even across all of these different groups. Um, but um, but many also would have. I mean, the, I guess the other thing to really emphasize here is the degree of multilingualism which everybody would have had. So, to me, it, it's doubtful that there would have been almost any monolingual people in in early New Amsterdam. And that's, I think, a crucial point. So uh, whether it was native peoples learning, learning Dutch, uh, whether it was enslaved Africans who were using Portuguese or, or, or Portuguese-based Creoles among themselves, uh, or whether it was other Europeans, you know, uh, it was extraordinary multilingualism kind of in individuals themselves as well. And, um, you know, a lot of people would have known Dutch as a second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth language, and they would might have had experience with the West India Company. That was uh, 
you know, itself a very multilingual enterprise. They might have been coming from Amsterdam, which itself in this period was perhaps the most linguistically diverse city in Europe and had sort of refugees themselves, you know, especially religious refugees who'd come from all over. Um, you know, there were, and, and I, a part of why I've put things like Polish slash, slash Lithuanian or Arabic slash Turkish, you might wonder, well, what, these are totally different languages. Why have I kind of put these? Uh, it's partly because uh, there's some indeterminacy in knowing what somebody uh, from the Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth, which was the polity, the state at that time that existed in that area, what they would have spoken, likely both. And, you know, there was at least one individual who, who spent some time uh, in New Amsterdam, prominent individual who was from that area, whose kind of ethnicity and linguistic background has been much debated, actually. Was he Polish? Was he Lithuanian? Did he speak both? The same goes for, you know, the first, uh, you know, well, who's been called the first Italian American as well, was from Venice. Those who understand uh, the linguistic geography of Italy will know that Venetian or Veneto is very different from, you know, standard Italian as it has kind of later consolidated and spread only since the mid late 19th century. Um, but, you know, what exactly perhaps, you know, what exactly did, did, the, did that individual speak? Uh, the same kind of questions about, you know, I, I think so part of, you know, we could talk about each of these at, at a lot of length. Unfortunately, we don't have, we don't have time, but, um, you know, part of what I'm, what I want to kind of try to bring in here is just that, uh, the map of the world was very different back then. This is a world before nation states, really. It's a world of empires and outposts, but also of highly and, and commercial empires as well as political ones, but also of extraordinary multilingualism and of highly local identities um, that were connected with, you know, particular mother tongues um, that might, you know, really be specific to a to a region that is no longer that people would not even be familiar with today. Um, so. You know, I think uh, we can't even really fathom some of the diversity now coming as we do from a world of increasingly standardized national languages promoted through writing. You know, mo most of this is oral, right? We're talking about oral languages. We're talking about just, you know, people finding ways to communicate as opposed to, um, you know, sort of standardized languages of of, of writing uh, that are you know that are being taught in schools and enforced by governments. So, uh, you know, this is uh, and this is still remains an issue as I as I look at in in, in my book and as our uh, the uh, Endangered Language Alliance our language map of New York City, which I hope everyone will will take a look at. Maybe we'll show a quick slide from later. Um, actually, maybe you want to go forward uh, to another slide, Peter. Uh, and, um, you know, even many of the languages, yeah, so this is, this is, this is the language map of New York City I just referred to. This is kind of looking, going a little bit later and showing uh, some of the historical, uh, what I'm calling historical languages, but, you know, languages then brought by subsequent immigrants leading up to the great major waves of late 19th century immigration uh, in Lower Manhattan, then the focus. Uh, and then, uh, and then maybe if you can go even to the next one, just quickly, um, this is the language map sort of today, the over 700 languages that we've referred to. And, uh, if you go to languagemap.nyc, we can maybe put that in the chat after, um, if you haven't been there already, you can click on each of these and sort of, uh, you know, hear recordings in many cases, find out more information about different communities. Most of these are present day communities from all over the world, and this is color coded by region of the world, um, but uh, it does include, you know, historical languages as well. Um, and uh, the point I just want to make here is that most of these as well are oral languages uh, that are non, not necessarily standardized. These are not the, when we talk about the 700 plus languages of New York, we're talking about the languages of local places as spoken by, you know, minority peoples, indigenous peoples from different parts of the world, the uh, national languages that people have heard of and might be talking about English, Spanish, Mandarin, Polish, you know, those are only one portion of them. Yes, those constitute, you know, large numbers and, and we know them, uh, we're familiar with them. But actually, if you really want to get at linguistic diversity, even today, and especially back then, um, you really need to understand what is spoken by people locally um, and uh, orally. And uh, so I've tried to sort of bring this eye for contemporary linguistic diversity, 
uh, to to an understanding of uh, of what it was like and would have been like in New Amsterdam as well, where you know the sources are uh, are thin on the ground, especially the written sources are only going to be in a few languages, but uh, there's much that we can clearly surmise from people's backgrounds, where they were from, and what is known about what, what would have actually been spoken in those places at the time. Well, I just, and just to underscore um, the point, uh, you know, I think maybe something uh, we take for granted as historians and linguists, uh, but something to share with the audience if they're not familiar with it already, you know, uh, we're talking about 700 languages, which I imagine um, some will find uh, very surprising, just the, the sheer number of that. But of course, there are what seven thousand languages that are that are extant at the at the current moment. Um, the vast majority of them, and this is part of the this is the you know the second and third part of your book that talks about the work of the Endangered Language Alliance. The vast majority of them endangered, spoken by fewer and fewer numbers of people. But that's to the point you're making about um, what we take for granted living in our time period and thinking that this was the way it always was. Um, you know there were. Uh, uh, you know, thousands of, of languages that belong to groups who, who have either sort of like uh, disappeared from history in terms of blending into these larger polities, the state often functioning as a major force historically in standardizing these languages and wiping out some of these dialects, uh, or wiping out some of those peoples entirely. Um, so uh, it's a it's a it's a it's a very important point. I think that. Um, um, uh, People forget and take for granted um, that um, the world was 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 a lot more linguistically diverse. It was a lot more culturally diverse, and a large part of that story is just the rise of these nation states and and you know the the conquest and the uh, and the and the um, um, uh, uh, cultural assimilation and cultural annihilation that that unfortunately went with that. Um, yeah, I'll just I'll just add to that. Yeah. I in total agreement, but I'll, I'll just add that, uh, you know, that still though, that New Amsterdam uh, back then and New, New York today are, are extraordinary in this regard. And it's important to kind of situate New Amsterdam, you know, in the context of some of the other colonies of the period, um, whether it be, you know, Massachusetts Bay Colony or Virginia, uh, these, you know, the other kind of, and then even the subsequent things, but, uh, you know, in that earliest period, those seem to have been largely English, spaces really almost english only spaces from from what i've from what i've seen um you know sure there there would have been um the pilgrims are an interesting example right and they a number of them had spent time many of them had spent time in leiden and and also probably picked up some amount of dutch uh again they were religious refugees to the netherlands just as so many so many groups were at the time uh but once they came to massachusetts bay and in terms of their makeup who they were as a group i mean these were english speakers uh, and just given the degree of uh, religious intolerance that they had and that you had to really be of the same background, uh, you know, that uh, that really didn't bode well for having much linguistic diversity. So the fact of, you know, Dutch sort of the commercial ethos and then, however, grudging the sort of the religious tolerance in particular, because it was religious diversity often that brought uh, the, the the linguistic diversity as well. And there was a complex interplay between kind of uh, those two forms of diversity, right? Because, you know, because often these religious movements and, and groupings were kind of anchored in particular places. Uh, obviously, you know, that there were, for instance, you know, people, you know, the Waldensian religious migrant, religious refugees who came in the 1650s uh, to New Amsterdam, you know, had a particular, you know, their own particular series of migrations that they had made. They were people from a particular place. Yes, they were also united by religion, but you know, they they were speakers of a type of a uh, type of French, as far as we can tell, based on what their you know their history had been. So, uh, the, the those factors did make this kind of a unique space, uh, and uh, there were places that were kind of more like English only, even at that time. So, New Amsterdam, you know, then kind of established this template. And we see it kind of surviving fairly well at first in uh, into New York, into the English period. Uh, but then, you know, there is a there there is a, a back and forth where is it you know is English going to sort of take over? To what extent is kind of diverse linguistically diverse migration going to continue? 
uh, in the English period. And uh, it sort of goes back and forth, you know, and, and, and we've been seeing that kind of ever since. Well, I, uh, we're at seven o'clock officially, um, and um, this is, uh, I'm tempted to sort of go into some of our last comments, um, uh, last questions we had sketched out here about um, taking us into the British era, which you're hinting at. Um, I wanna remind our audience that if you uh, wanna send in questions, um, please do so using the Q&A icon at the bottom of the screen. Normally we would pause here, leave the last hour, half hour for your questions, but just to, just to wrap up, Maybe you can just continue a bit more and tell us what does happen to these languages in the in the British era. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about and sort of give us a little bookend on this on the the Dutch era? How do how do how do the how does the Dutch fare and and what happens to this linguistic diversity? So those are yeah two two large uh, and and different questions in terms of how Dutch fares. Uh, there has been some 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 really good research and and, and work on this, uh, and uh, it's kind of an extraordinary story unto itself. Um, I think Dutch survives a lot you know a lot longer than most people might have expected, uh, and um, it certainly survives, of course, in certain words people like to cite, even individual words like boss or cookie or, you know, among others that seem to uh, to enter, you know, into local forms of English and then in terms into global forms of English. But in terms of a spoken, uh, you know, as a spoken language um, that is being, you know, used on a daily basis, uh, Dutch seems to continue very strongly, you know, in in what is today the city. Uh, you know, into the 18th century, certainly, uh, but then there begin to be some stronger efforts by the English to kind of uh, uh, to, to sort of push it out, including a canny bit of language policy by uh, Lord Cornbury uh, in the 1720s, I think, uh, who tries to kind of um, clamp down on the Dutch schools and kind of get people to send people, you know, their kids to the Anglican schools, make it harder for the Dutch schools to function. The Dutch Reformed Church plays a famously important role in the maintenance of Dutch. Um, and, uh, you know, Brooklyn, within the city, Brooklyn, which had the, the sort of the, the most concentrated presence of the old Dutch families on landed estates. Um, you know, there's plenty of testimony that, uh, that that Dutch is being spoken even by, you know, still by, by mostly elderly people, I think, until the mid 19th century in Brooklyn. And if you go beyond the city, uh, it's even you know lasting perhaps even longer. You go up the Hudson, you go up to uh, areas around Albany, the Mohawk Valley. Um, Dutch, you know, survives in in various forms. There's something called Jersey Dutch, which survives among mixed race communities in the Hudson Highlands. Um, you know, there and there there has been some you know there's some there was some kind of belated research as well or attempts to document what exactly was this Dutch and there was even a Dutch traveler or, or more than one Dutch traveler who came in the late 18th century and kind of experienced this and found it you know extraordinary that this was still being that some kind of Dutch was still being spoken and that it was quite different now by what was then being spoken in the Netherlands uh, there was a kind of divergence a loss of contact which leads to you know, um, and and there are various theories about why exactly that happened, uh, what exactly that looked like, uh, but there's really fascinating evidence about what forms of Dutch were actually remaining and how they differed. And of course, they took on English influence. A lot of people don't know that Sojourner Truth, until she was the age of 11, um, growing up near Kingston, uh, born in 1797, she is speaking Dutch until she's 11 and only then learning English, although becomes famous for her English oratory. Uh, and in this, you know, actually, this is a, a larger point about, uh, again, enslaved, enslaved people, um, you know, who are often associated with Dutch families and in more rural settings, maintaining Dutch perhaps the longest. Uh, and there's the evidence of um, uh, the, the sort of the dark evidence of runaway slave advertisements, which were, you know, would say that such and so-and-so speaks Dutch. Uh, so Dutch survives, you know, there are even reports of, 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 of it surviving in some form, in, you know, well into the 20th century uh, with some individuals. But, you know, at, at that point, things become kind of trickier to, to, to adjudicate. But in terms of the other languages, much less so. So of all those languages that I showed, um, you know, there is very little evidence of intergenerational transmission. Uh, and this is an issue to this day in terms of New York's linguistic diversity and a wider question about, you know, the linguistic diversity of cities and sort of trading ports and entrepôts. You know, they draw in an extraordinary range of people who are attracted to them for 
you know, commercial opportunities, uh, refuge, and so on. But then the actual business of passing on a language and maintaining a community language uh, is very different. So, you know, I think uh, the pressures that we know, but the pressures that face native languages, that faced African languages, but then also the smaller European languages as well would probably have had very little scope for, for survival. Um, so really, you're just looking at a couple of, uh, I mean, in the families and in the individuals who had already come here. Uh, so, you know, there would have been a few like French, notably, um, which, uh, and perhaps Portuguese to a degree, you know, uh, that, that there might have been, there probably was some level of intergenerational transmission, but the evidence is, is sparse. So that makes it that, you know, the important thing is really about uh, new waves of immigrants, right? You're not going to have actual in situ continuity um, of these languages uh, for the most part. And this, even today, you know, this is the, the pattern and the issue uh, with, uh, with, with language and immigration, that beyond the third generation, famously, um, there's just the pressure to shift linguistically to that, that lingua franca, that thing that started as lingua franca ends up becoming the dominant language. So it's really only through continual um, continual migration that you see uh, that you see continuity, uh, or or you know that you have new speakers refreshing the sort of the pool. Uh, but what happens, you know, by the later in the English period, as English dominance kind of takes deeper hold, um, second half of the 18th century, first half of the 19th century, a lot of the immigration is coming from English speaking places. A diverse range of Englishes, perhaps from parts of Scotland and Ireland, for instance, that were, you know, had themselves been under a lot of pressure to, to switch to English. Uh, but um, it's really not until the early 19th century, I think, early mid 19th century, uh, with the large waves of Germanic language speakers and then Irish speakers with the famine, uh, that you begin to see large new communities of non English speakers coming and establishing themselves in New York. Um, I'm tempted to um, follow up with a bunch of my own questions, but I've got I've got your phone number, so I'm going to do the right thing here and start taking the questions from the audience. Uh, so first question at the top, properly so, Russell Shorto, um, thanks for this long past due question. Lenape, Delaware, Muncie, are all used in an overlapping sense? All are used in an overlapping sense. Can you tease out what each refers to? I think you did that a Thank bit you. before, but I think that would that's a good question. Yeah, no, no, this is important because it, it it's it's obviously gets kind of confusing for people all the the, the nomenclature. Uh, so I think the you know probably the easiest, the most straightforward term to use overall to speak of this whole kind of complex of 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 languages that were spoken in you know the greater New York area, but really the whole Delaware River watershed. Is Lenape right? That would be the 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 the, the best contemporary term now to use. Uh, it, of course, it is a Lenape word itself. But that, that term, I think, captures it uh, best, and and is the one that speakers themselves today and those revitalizing it would use. But that said, Delaware is also quite commonly used. As I said, that's the exonym, the outsider name, but it's basically refers to the same thing. Delaware and Lenape are referring to the same thing. One is the kind of outsider term. One is the sort of inside term. But then again, Delaware, you know, even though it began as an outside term uh, named after this, uh, the Virginia governor, this the, the governor Delaware, this uh, English governor, uh, and then the river was named after him and then the people were named after him. So it was an outside term, but then it has kind of become entrenched in certain ways. Uh, so it's not necessarily an offensive term. It's not necessarily a problematic term. It's just the old outsider term. And so some of the tribal names use it, you know, the Delaware nation of Oklahoma, for instance, I mean, these are the terms, or if you uh, look at some of the linguistic sources, a lot of the papers and dictionaries and so on, will say Delaware, because that is this kind of, you know, became entrenched as a term and it's not necessarily problematic. It would be used by older, some older speakers as well. So, you know, the best uh, dictionary of, uh, of Muncie actually is known as the Delaware, you know, the Delaware English Dictionary. That's by John O'Meara, working with speakers in Ontario. So Delaware and Lenape basically the same, but one is kind of outsider, insider. Uh, as for Muncie, that is a kind of regional grouping that refers to the northern piece of Lenape slash Delaware. And then Unami is the term that refers to the whole southern piece of 
Lenape slash Delaware. And there, there's a, there, there, there are differences there, but you know, Lenape, the overall term, Delaware, the kind of European name, Muncie, the Northern group, Unami, the Southern group within that. Um, and the Muncie were part of that larger algic family that that um, stretches from uh, uh, as far as California up to Nova, Co Nova Scotia and further points south in the, in the southeast, right? All of these, yeah. So yeah, Muncie, you could say Muncie is part of Lenape and Lenape is part of algic. Uh, that's the that's the kind of highest order term. But it is kind of a nested, a series of kind of nested dolls as these language families kind of go. Yeah. Barbara Mills asks to this question of the diversity among those the, those groups. Um, uh, did you find any evidence that there were other ways uh, aside from sort of maybe this pidgin or maybe some you know some of these languages maybe or dialects being more dominant sort of lingua francas? Were there other evidences of communication that you encountered? Uh, hand signs or or something of that of that kind, or was this something? Well, I'll let you answer the question. Yeah, in terms of native, in terms of native languages, right? Is that the yes. question? Um, I haven't. Besides, I mean, I, I mentioned Delaware Pigeon as a kind of contact language between you know native and and European peoples, uh, but in terms of a lingua franca or other, like how exactly native peoples communicated with each other. Um, I think that the evidence is just not there. Unfortunately, it's 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 not it's not clear. Um, you know, well, we do I do know. I mean, people maybe know this in the audience, but we do know that there were um, at least there's evidence that there were quite trade networks that that extended over quite a huge distance. Um, yeah. Despite all the challenges, the transportation, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, and how? Yeah. As I said, those trade networks perhaps you know were expanding in the Dutch period, so we don't know what they were like before. At the same time, there probably were a lot of communities which were relatively self-sufficient, you know, with subsistence practices um, in relatively small settings. Um, so, yeah, it's. I think there would have been. I mean, the the, the degree of mutual intelligibility that existed within the whole Len Lenape world, but then also, you know, uh, the wider Eastern Algonquian world, which. Sorry to add another level. This is kind of under Algic, Eastern Algonquian, and then under that, Lenape, and then under that, Muncie and Unami. So, you know, I think it's likely that um, not only that Lenape speakers, especially those who traveled more, were able to kind of understand each other from area to area, uh, um, but also that, you know, interpretation and multilingualism were widespread practices, but also that you know those languages of Long Island and New England, those related Eastern Algonquian languages, also would have been close enough uh, that there would have been a, a certain degree of mutual intelligibility and ability to navigate those those differences. How people dealt with you know different language families, like the Iroquoian language family versus the Algic languages, uh, is 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 less clear is less clear to me i mean you know usually the, the 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 language of the more powerful is learned by the less powerful uh so it's certainly a possibility that there was you know at certain periods uh a lot of uh, bilingualism where lenape speakers might have needed to know some susquehannock or something like that but i feel unfortunately the evidence is just is, is thin so it is it is pretty conjectural yeah. Lynn Hayden Finley has an excellent question. Um, in an economy of trapping, um, trade, uh, uh, merchants, uh, sailors, and ships, et cetera, uh, how, do, how did le levels of education influence language beyond birth language? Um, you kind of indicate that um, it's really, uh, it goes beyond, which was I found fascinating. It really sort of goes quite beyond um, even just those, uh, those uh, traders and others who sort of functioned as the intermediaries between these cultures is that is that fit? yeah no this is a, it's a it's a very interesting question that is uh you know i haven't really gone deep into but i i, I remember one kind of intriguing example is jonas bronk uh who um you know famously gave his name to the bronx uh but seems to have been a fairly educated man right he came and and, and settled that area and uh you know, there's a lot of actually debate about what exactly his background was. Was he um, uh, was he Danish? Was he Swedish? Was he what exactly? Uh, I forget a few other a few other options because again, 
part of the problem of projecting back these nation states. My Danish grandfather is very convinced he was Danish. So he was Danish. Okay, okay. No, there's a, there's a lot of interesting or uh, or um, uh, what's the other option? Yeah, there's there's a few different interesting discussions there, but uh, but the thing that is is kind of known um, is that uh, he left like a little library at his death, uh, a collection of books, which I think there were books in, if I'm not mistaken, German, English, and or German, Dutch, and uh, Danish, I believe. At least three, at least three languages. Maybe not English. I have to double check, but you know. Uh, so here was a, one, a relatively educated person who, um, perhaps to an unusual degree, but there's a uh, multilingualism in the, uh, you know, in the library there. And people did have libraries, and people did have yeah. books. Uh, and uh, the famous uh, Anthony Van Sali, the quote unquote the Turk, uh, who you know, himself had a very complex linguistic background, another sort of colorful, well-known early settler of New Amsterdam, who clearly spoke Dutch, uh, but uh, had family roots and maybe grew up between kind of what's now Morocco, uh, likely speaking some kind of Moroccan Arabic, perhaps Turkish, because that was part of what was going on there. Perhaps the original lingua franca, which was the, you know, used in the Mediterranean at, at that time. You know, he was rumored at least to have a copy of the Quran that he had with him in New Amsterdam, whether that's true or not. Um, you know, the uh, the Jewish, the initial wave of Jewish settlers who came from um, Recife in Brazil, who would have been probably Portuguese speakers or perhaps a kind of Judeo-Portuguese, which there's a little bit of evidence for, um, who, uh, you know, likely would have been having Hebrew as a liturgical language, not a spoken everyday language necessarily, but so there would have been these liturgical languages or things connected with uh connected with books. So there would have been, you know, forms of literacy and forms of language knowledge based on that. Uh, I haven't looked into it deeply, but it's intriguing. Uh, well, just to piggyback on that, we have a question about whether Ladino was spoken. Was that part of the mix, this, the language of the Portuguese Jews in Brazil? That's, yeah, that's, it's an interesting kind of speculative question. I, I, I have, I have, I have uh, actually looked into the sort of the modern history of Ladino in, uh, in New York, which um, really begins or comes full force in the late 19th century, early 20th century, with large numbers of of people coming from what's now you know Greece and Turkey, you know uh, places like Salonika and Izmir, um, Istanbul, uh, these places, uh, and that brought tens of thousands of Ladino speakers clearly uh, to to the city. Whether those Portuguese Jews who were coming kind of via Brazil, whether they spoke Ladino as we now think of it. Um, is uh is not is not clear um and uh it may be i don't think there's any direct evidence for it um and uh it may be actually that it was i mean it's it's clear that they kind of by that point whatever we're, we're using portuguese more um and uh and then and then you know following in with dutch and of course later shifting you know people shifting to english but uh so it may have been a kind of ladino equivalent in a sense uh but with portuguese uh, or again, not that the not that these lines were exactly fully drawn at that time, but it put a little, it would look a little different from Ladino and would have you know not been directly referred to with that kind of name at that time. Right, right. right. Um, Cheryl Woodruff writes to ask um, whether we have um, maps of the languages spoken in the New Amsterdam uh, period. I don't think that there are any maps from that time that have any linguistic evidence. Yeah, but, I don't uh, have any either. Yeah, but uh, but I would say, I mean, you know, we can look at the evidence of place names a little bit. Um, but uh, you know, what what we have been able to sort of reconstruct, you'll you'll find in the in the language map.nyc the the link that Peter put out there. There's also a print version of that map for anybody who wants a sort of beautiful print version. The proceeds of that. Uh, you you'd have to donate for uh, will uh, go to the Endangered Language Alliance and our work, but that shows both all the present day languages, but also uh, will show all the ones that I've mentioned here, whether it's you know Malagasy, Akan, Lenape, Flemish, they're all also there. And you can even sort of filter, if you go really into the language map.nyc, you can filter for the historical languages and see the ones that are you know from older times. Um, we have questions about um, how Germans fit into the picture. Um, 
Uh, obviously, it's still spoken in the Amish communities in the Mohawk Valley, expanded uh, to the Pennsylvania, the so-called Pennsylvania Dutch. Uh, did you encounter any of that in your... Yeah, German is an important piece of the picture. Uh, <clears throat> I say German in quotes because really we should talk about sort of Germanic, Germanic languages. And, um, <clears throat> but it would have been, you know, one of the major kind of groupings of European languages. Uh, and this is a time before, uh, well before the unification of Germany, well before sort of uh, standard high German had kind of become this national language. So there were clearly a lot of Plattdeutsch speakers, low German speakers, probably predominated uh, from Northern Germany, which is quite different from standard German. Uh, there would have been a lot of diversity. There were a lot of people who um, would have spoken the uh, the kind of Palatine uh, Deutsch from the Palatinate, which uh, uh, that kind of become starts to become similar to what became Pennsylvania Pennsylvania German later. Uh, but there were you know, there's a lot of linguistic diversity going on in kind of what's now Germany uh, and the Germanic lands kind of extended beyond what's now Germany. Um, there has been some kind of analysis of exactly where, um, you know, where the settlers came from their birthplaces. And that's our best, our best bet in terms of reconstructing that. But I think you would find, um, you know, quite a bit of Germanic, Germanic diversity in there. Of course, it explodes, you know, when you get to the mid 19th century, then you have every kind of Germanic language spoken here in Klein Deutschland on the, the sort of Lower East Side East Village. But uh, even in those early years, yeah, German kind of Germanic German speakers of, of different kinds were, uh, yeah. were a sizable group. Uh, we have a couple of, there's a couple more questions to get to, but uh, since some people are, have been asking for the title of your book, uh, which is yet to be determined, um, yeah. I just want to uh, direct people to the Gotham Center web, website, gothamcenter.org, where you will find uh, information about our past and present writing fellows, and you'll find Ross's pr uh, profile, and you can read more about his work. Um, the Gotham Center will also uh, be presenting um, uh, sometime before the uh, end of the year, hopefully, a digital exhibit that will be featuring the wider scope of historical work that uh, is featured in Ross's book, um, which was tentatively titled once, and I still like this title, Babel in Reverse. But um, yeah, uh, uh, back to the question of the Dutch, we have a couple of questions here about whether or not um, any of the Lenape or other indigenous words might have been incorporated into that and whether we have any sense of, of what the attitudes were, the dominant attitudes of the elite about this linguistic diversity. Lenape words into Dutch, is that the... Well, and I think, you know, more broadly too, I mean, um, uh, you've, you've, you know, uh, pointed out rightly that, you know, New York really does stand out in terms of this uh, incredible linguistic diversity. And as has been said before, you know, the commercial nature of the city obviously seems to um, uh, lend itself to that kind of um, spirit of tolerance and, and, uh, and mixing. Um, but uh, you've also hinted that there was anxiety, obviously, about uh, some of that by some of the actors involved. Yeah, so I mean, I'll, I'll say, yeah, thank, thanks for thanks for uh, the interest in the in the book. It probably will still be maybe a year or so before it's actually out. But I'm also I'm really happy for people to email me questions we don't get to. You can easily find me by googling me or going onto the Endangered Language Alliance website. My my contact info on my own website. Um, yeah, we'll have this 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 uh, this exhibit. And we'll have this conversation again at the Gotham Center. So. Yeah. So uh, please, you know, yeah. Thank you for uh, thank you for that. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm always happy to kind of have questions and hear more about this. Um, I think you know, there's just a larger question about how um, and maybe you know, kind of correct me, Peter, if I if I've kind of missed the question, but like how evanescent or temporary a lot of this this diversity was and you know people will, will often wonder you know what traces did it did it leave uh how long did it persist and um you know it's i think a lot of it is quite evanescent um on, uh, you know and, and that is part of the nature of the fluidity uh of you know we have to remember so many of the people themselves were passing through for a couple of years and then moving on somewhere else this has always been a sort of a gateway city and, and people were kind of coming through on their way to, you know, the interior or constantly moving, even moving within, you know, within the bounds of the city. Uh, so, you know, one thing that I've 
spent some, spent a lot of time researching in, in recent years is also just all of these kinds of forms of language contact, as linguists call it, that are happening in New York City. And this goes back to the Dutch period. You know, intensive contact where speakers of very different languages have to find a, a lingua franca, they have to be multilingual, they have to sort of shift to different languages, but they also are kind of keeping their own and they're mixing and you know, there's just this everyday multilingualism uh, and borrowing and code switching that's always going on. Um, but it often doesn't last. It's very evanescent. It's very hard to, to study for that reason. It's very oral. It doesn't necessarily leave any trace in the in the written record. Um, you know, it's there are certain cases where the impact is really deeper uh, and, you know, the traces are stronger. Uh, so the Dutch words in Lenape are an example of that. You know, it's clear that the impact of Dutch uh, culture, but also the force of Dutch might, um, you know, really made it that, that that a lot of a lot of words entered Lenape. Those are not, you know, it's not clear how many of those uh, are, are still being used, but, you know, certainly some. Um, and uh, others, other forms of contact, though, would have been pretty evanescent or day to day. Well, uh, um, we have uh, too many questions, I'm afraid, to answer in the next five minutes. So I have, I have the unfortunate uh, obligation here to single out a couple of uh, questions for uh, closing us out. Um, uh, uh, just a note, um, Esme Berg, who uh, 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 was uh, an excellent, uh, uh, was uh, instrumental, uh, hugely instrumental in putting on tonight's discussion, and I thank her for that, um, asks and just puts a note to the viewers that you can learn more about Anthony Van Soleil at the N uh, New Amsterdam History Center website um, and their program about the Dutch in Brooklyn. Um, uh, it's, uh, I really hate having to, <laughs> I can try to yeah, is it worth, I could try to go very quickly. I hate, to, I hate to, I hate to choose them on my children. Yes. Um, uh, you can, you can try to, if you want to take your stab at this for us, that's fine. I'll, by try you. To, I'll try to take a couple of these on. Yeah, so yes. here to get these are great. Right. Yeah. These are great kind of detailed, detailed, uh, specific questions here. Uh, yes, Peter Stuyvesant. You know, certainly seems to have been Frisian. It's likely that he was a speaker of a form of Frisian. Uh, yes, Irish Gaelic. Uh, Irish was became a very significant language in New York. I have some estimates that'll be in my book in the mid, you know, by the mid 19th century, people were really coming from the Gaelic speaking areas. Um, yes, I mean, I, I, it's it's great to see kind of the interest in particular figures and histories. Uh, Alexander Curtius, uh, as his kind of Latin name was, is. Uh, is is often kind of cited as the uh, the the sort of the person from the Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth who kind of came first and would have spoken Polish and Lithuanian. Uh, Afrikaans is an interesting kind of comparison, perhaps, with the the Dutch of um, of New Amsterdam and later the kind of uh, forms of Dutch that persisted in New York. Uh, I don't know if anybody has kind of tried to do those comparisons. I mean, unfortunately, you know, the records are much spottier for the forms of Dutch here. Um, and uh, the Manhattan etymology, of course, always a, fav a favorite topic. Uh, broadly, yes, the, the the place where timber is procured for bows and arrows, that kind of seems to broadly be what uh, Ives Goddard in that article I mentioned seems to, seems to support. Albert Anthony was a 19th century Lenape speaker who uh, gave some evidence on that, on that account. Um, and uh, and yeah, I'd be happy to 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 share in some form these uh, these 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 five uh, these these images from 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 this. Um, and uh, you know, uh, in terms of uh, yeah, Portuguese, uh, the sea, the sea strength was certainly an important part of uh, you know their trading networks, their involvement in the slave trade, their mercantile. You know, seems to have been part of why um, you know Portuguese Creoles became very important transatlantic languages. Uh, and as for in, you know enslaved Africans in other colonies, I don't know. That would be very interesting to know what those patterns were and what languages uh, they spoke, uh, likely. So um, uh, you know, very interesting about kind of uh, Dutch Dutch language experiences at different times in 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 New York. Uh, and uh, you know, yes, this is what happens with time. Even even fifty years. 
of, of immigration can open up a difference between the sort of metropolitan, so-called metropolitan version of a language and the diaspora version of a language. So we see this all the time with, with immigrant languages. You can imagine at the level of a few hundred years before communications technologies, what kinds of differences could open up between languages. Well, that was a very, very <laughs> impressive, like lightning fast uh, dispatching of questions. Uh, I, I'm impressed. Um, uh, I want to, we're, we're a minute to closing here. I want to thank everyone for joining us tonight. I want to remind you that this is going to be recorded and it will be shared on the Gotham Center's channel on YouTube and the New Amsterdam History Center's website and channel. Uh, I want to thank you for joining us, Ross. I want to remind everyone also that this is part of a larger project. You can learn more about that at thegothamcenter.org. Um, we will also be um, absolutely having Ross come back to the Gotham Center to talk about the larger project when the book is published and titled um, sometime, hopefully in the next year. Um, Ross, uh, uh, I could talk about this with you all night and we have done that several times before. Um, I just want to thank you for, for joining us. I want to thank our friends of the New York, the New Amsterdam History Center for, for um, spotlighting early on some of the excellent work that you've been doing. And um, we are very, very excited about this project and cannot wait to see it come to fruition. Great, and thank you so much, Peter, for uh, for the discussion, and thank you all for 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 coming and being here for wonderful questions. And um, please, please be in touch. And uh, thanks again. Well, thank you. Good night. <laughs>